Good morning. You guys ready? Are you sure? So uh, Larry and I were chatting last night, and he was like, hey, you got a word? And I was like, yeah, in season and out, even though I didn't have a word. Um, but I've always said yes. I removed no from my vocabulary. It's a good thing. Right? Should I do this? Should I do that? You just, yes. Right? I think we, 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 we screw a lot of things up by, uh, by weighing it. It's really fear. Most people say no out of fear. They just fight with the Bible, but that's weird. So I said yes. And, uh, and man, here's the crazy thing. Like, uh, if you've been coming to Wednesdays, we've been talking a lot about, uh, you know, moving in the spirit and the seasons and the times. And, man, one of the things that I feel like Larry and I have been having this conversation every week on, man, we're just like, we feel like we're in the throngs of something, not sleeping. I just started to sleep a couple of days ago. It was the, it was the best. And then Larry asked me to do this. Boom, 2.30, I'm up. Larry, it was like, I heard the Bob Jones story where you were in Bethel, I think it was. Chris, Chris Valentin shared it. And uh, you, you <laughs> I love this. And you, went, you, you and Bob were in, were in Reading. And uh, I guess North Carolina. Okay, whatever. Never mind. You can preach if you want. Uh, <laughs> At the embassy hotel? No, I'm just kidding. No, I, I, no facts, facts are important, and, and the details matter. Em embassy suites at a conference, and I guess, like, the demonic showed up in his room. Okay? For those of you who couldn't hear it, Larry said he had been to Indonesia, and the demons had followed him back, and they went and showed up in Bob's, in your room, at 2 in the morning, and then you sent him over to Bob's. Hold on, we gotta catch, we gotta capture this. Here you go. Uh, in, Indonesia had a great meetings in Indonesia, but I don't know if you know that, but the third world countries have their share of demons. Sometimes. And some of them flew back with me, yeah. I think, because I, I woke up at two in the morning and there was, there was this evil spirit in the room. And I actually called the front desk and said, there's a demon you know, in the room, can you do something about it? <laughs> and uh, and uh, anyway, they said, well, can you, I didn't know the, the, the gal that answered the phone, by the way, w went to Morningstar Ministry at the time. She said, oh, really? She said, is it actually She said, don't tell my boss because they'll charge you double occupancy. But anyway, so anyway, so there's always a smart aleck somewhere. And it, well, no, I, let me tell you. So this demon shows up and, uh, and just goes, woo! And it's like, oh, my gosh. It was like scary. It was weird, crazy. Uh, we were doing the conference uh, together at uh, Morningstar Ministry. Bob Jones was four, four doors down and, uh, at the Embassy Suites. And it was, um, uh, he, and uh, so I go out the door, and because sweet, you go down to get your uh, breakfast downstairs. We're on the fifth floor. I got to go to the door, and Bob comes out a door about four doors down from me. I didn't even know he was there yet, but he was there. And he walks out, and he looks at me, and he goes, ooh, boy. <laughs> he, go, he goes, look at you. Did you see that thing last night around 2 o'clock? And I thought, jeez. <laughs> I said, yeah. He said, well, he came to my room about 1.30, and I just sent him to your room. <laughs> I said, Bob, why would you do that? He said, because I'm just an old, old man, and you're young, and the Scripture says you've overcome the wicked one. I said, thanks, Bob. You're buying breakfast this morning. I know that. So anyway, so I got a breakfast out of that demon story. So. I love it. Uh, long story short, that so your sleeplessness jumped on me last night. And uh, so I was praying through this morning, and, and, and then as I was driving over here, I felt like the Lord had something really specific for this morning. So forgive me if I blunder through this a little bit, but uh, there's something, something heavy on my heart. And I'm going to ask you guys, it's not heavy though, don't worry, come on. Uh, yeah. Ooh. We're already talking about the demonic. Uh, but it's something that I really, I really feel is on the heart of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you for this morning. Uh, I thank you for each and every one in here, Lord. I thank you for what you're doing in our lives, what you're doing in Tennessee, what you're doing in our families, our businesses, Lord. We just give you all the praise. And Lord, today, I ask, precious Holy Spirit, that you would rest in this place and rest in this time. In Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said? Amen. Amen to the men. Um, uh, last weekend, I was in Pennsylvania at an amazing youth event. In fact, we had a couple, yeah, you guys came, came out to the event. It was awesome. Uh, we, we baptized about, I don't know, 30, 
30 youth at the end of the day. It was so precious. Uh, midnight, 11 o'clock, something like that. We were out in the parking lot dunking them in, in, a, in a pool. And uh, in the parking lot of the Global Awakening, Randy Clark's building. And it was just so precious. And right before that, we had this uh, time where we asked the Holy Spirit to just come and baptize kids. And uh, I was meditating on, on it, on, on this moment of, of not just baptism in water, but baptism in the Spirit. And then late last night, as I was uh, in bed trying to sleep, but not, I started going through my Facebook, which I don't use Facebook. Like, it posts automatically if you follow what I do on Facebook. Um, and, but I haven't really got on it in years. And I started pulling up all these old videos. There's videos of Jeff, my mom and dad. There's stuff with Larry. I even sent Larry a picture that I found of me, of you holding Josiah when he must have been about a year, year old in the Global Awakening building. There's, man, and I just, I just love those memories. And there was this one video that I came across that I totally forgot about. And it was this, it was uh, a trip in Paisley, Scotland. That I, that I went on years ago. And man, I didn't want to be at this church and they didn't want me there either, right? They were kind of treating me like, like you are. And uh, no, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. You know, just staring at me. And, uh, and, they, and, and I remember just going, Holy Spirit, come. But like, he just didn't, he didn't want to, right? And I'm like, God, am I in sin or whatever? And so, you know, I'm a fan of you, you press in, right? You plow. Sometimes it's easy, sometimes you gotta plow. Sometimes you actually have to press in. And so I got upset, because I had flown all that way. And man, a little anger is not a bad thing. You know, like, you know, you put the word holy in front of any word and it becomes godly, you know, like righteous anger, holy anger. And so I, I put the word holy on it. And I, and, I am, and I am going for it, right? I'm like, y'all are gonna get touched by God. I'm just yelling at him. Nothing, nothing. Like, they're just standing there like dead trees. And so I look over and I see this row of kids. I don't know, about uh, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, maybe six of them. And uh, I said, well, the adults aren't working. There's no leading of the Lord. This is all just me, right? The adults aren't working, so let's try the kids. I go, uh, six of you, come here. And I line them up shoulder to shoulder. Paisley, Scotland. It, which is where the pattern Paisley came from. Fun fact, you're welcome. You can thank me later. Uh, and line them up. And, and as they come forward, bang, God falls on them. It was, it was powerful. In fact, to the day, to this day, it's the only time I have had someone uh, like physically threaten to beat me up. Not the only time. It's one of the only times <laughs> I've had someone physically threaten to beat me up uh, out of fear in the, with the way that God was moving. It was terrifying. So there's, there's a thing of being comfortable in the move of God that's beautiful, but it's also dangerous. You, when you get used to God moving a certain way, and God, not, not only was God moving in the craziest of ways, he was... It was, the sound was terrifying. And so I came back and I recorded a video, which I have on my Facebook. And it's just me and my chubby face, at, like sweaty at midnight. And, and I play, because I knew that I couldn't put the video up. If I put the video up, it would have been bad. So I just played the audio, which sounded even worse. And as I'm watching me share this testimony, uh, I could hear in the background, and it is the sound of what seems to be like kids being murdered. It, it's terrifying. But as you got close to them, right, you heard them crying out the name Jesus. But when you pulled back, it was just ah, like this noise. Okay, let me ask you a question. Have you ever been to a revival? Have you been to a meeting where the presence of God is so thick in the room? right? Ministry's going on. Nobody's looking at a clock. No one cares who's speaking, but God is there. And have you ever pulled back from that moment and listened to the sound? There is a sound 
when the Holy Spirit moves that I know, listen, I'm going to be talking way out of my, uh, my pay grade this morning because I know I'm in the city of Nashville and I know we have people that have spent their whole life creating sound. However, I've never heard anybody create a sound like this. Never. Never. It's when the Holy Spirit is moving and people are getting set free, people are getting healed, people are getting delivered, people are encountering his face, people, people are encountering love for the first time. There is a sound of revival. There is a sound in the move of God that is mind-boggling at best. And any time somebody tries to create it, they fail miserably. There are certain things that you can only get in his presence. And if you haven't heard what I'm talking about, stick around. It's not just today. Just stick around the move of God. Sometimes we miss it because we're in it and the Lord's touching us. Sometimes we come very very self-centered, Lord, which isn't a bad thing. There's times when he, when, when he comes and moves on us, but the next revival meeting you're in, where God is moving in a way that is so powerful, pull back and take note of the sound. Not the worship, the sound. When God moves, it sounds like something. It's freedom, love, chaos, joy, happiness, uh, singing in the spirit. It's intercession. It's love. It's all at once. And at times, that sound can be terrifying. For, as I listened to it, I said, oh, my God, I can't believe I ever put this out. Because without any context, it literally is terrifying. But if you go into the individual you'll hear something different. I love order. I love uh, peace. I love all of those things. But so often we miss, we can miss what God is doing in the, in the lives of individuals. There's a beauty in the corporate, and then there's also a beauty in the individual, and we have to recognize both. And you know when revival is cooking. You know when a move of God is cooking when he's doing something corporately, but also if you go down to a person, you see a depth of him touching someone individually. Oh, it's a marker of a move of the spirit. Out of every major move has always come, to, come a sound. Every move of God has a sound. I just went to a concert on Monday, I flew from, uh, I love music, I, I always have. Um, I flew from Pennsylvania out to uh, Atlanta, and I went to a concert. Now, I won't, I won't tell you what concert, because people will have a hard time with that, but I have a friend that plays in a rock band that is not uh, a Christian rock band at all. And I grew up with their posters on my wall. And I got to go, I, I, every so often I go to spend time with, with my friend, make sure he's doing good, pray for him. And, uh, and I went to this show, and I've been to many, many, many rock shows. In fact, I like it even heavier than that. I, I always found that my sound was one of chaos. I, I let my wife listen to it. She's like, this sounds like Satan. I'm like, I feel the Lord on this, right? <laughs> right? It, it, it is, it is. There's something inside of me. Are you guys okay? Uh, we're going to go somewhere this morning. There's something inside of me that gets excited when I hear war, the sound of war. Now, you might not know this. I'm going to share some stuff that I don't normally share publicly. I am a spectacular musician. No, I'm not. I just lied to you. I can't say that. Okay. I, 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 I make some music sometimes. 
especially in my teenage years, I love uh, music. And I grew up in a family that loves music. My father, uh, Murray Hart, back there, uh, I grew up going to concerts with him. In fact, I was a boy soprano. Yeah. Do you know what that is? Right? You don't know what the boy soprano is, Larry? I'm sure you are a boy soprano. Uh, high voices, yeah? Like the, like the British, yeah. I could, I, could, I could hit some notes back in the day. Yeah, and then puberty. Um, <laughs> So I grew up in a musical family, even, even now to this day, one of my joys, and I, I'm sorry, Father, I'm saying this publicly, but one of my joys, and it's also one of the most awkward things, is watching my father weep as he plays um, uh, the Verdi Requiem. The Verdi Requiem. Verdi? Like Bach, Vivaldi, no? Okay, don't worry, I'm from Massachusetts, I'll help you. Right? Uh, how many of you guys love classical music, right? Oh, um, there is, I, who was it, Mozart, forgive me, I'm pulling out of memories from 20 years ago. Did he do the creation? The, who was it? Creation, he wrote the, it's, no, never mind, okay. There's a whole, there's a whole piece, I believe it was by Beethoven or, or Brahms, who, who did a whole orchestral, uh, piece on the creation of the world. Y Dad, you should know this. You're killing me. Hi what is it? Haydn. Haydn did that. I'm sorry. I was way off. But come on. That's pretty cool that I know something. Yeah, never mind. Uh, it is a, it's a requiem. And you listen to it, and it's literally the greats trying to put a sound behind the impossible. It's them trying to put a sound. What did it sound like at the creation of the world? See, there's a reason why all throughout Scripture, sound is important. God spoke and everything was created. A sound created everything. And then if I go back to maybe the concert that I was at where, uh, you know, a few uh, last Monday, there is a sound that creates something in the people that listen. See, for this crowd, it is, a, it is hopelessness draws them to a sound that celebrates or gives vision to coming out of hopelessness. It's actually not vision coming out. It's actually, I understand you in your hopelessness. And there's a sound there that gravitates people. I, I saw thousands and thousands of people cheering to the most chaotic. Sound is more important than what we think. Fun fact, I play the didgeridoo. Do you know this? The didgeridoo. It's from Arkansas. It's Australia. Uh, fun fact, I play the bagpipes. Not well, it's been a little while, and in fact, as I was looking at videos, I found a video of, of me in Scotland picking up the pipes after a long time. I, right after I got saved, I wanted to learn about worship. And I connected with a group that my mother and father were, the, were a part of called um, Eagle and Dove. They were a worship arts, this was like the first six months of my salvation. It's like a worship arts and dance crew. Yeah. I know how to do some warfare. <laughs> Hello? I know how to play a didgeridoo. And one of the reasons why I learned, one of the reasons why I learned to play the bagpipes was actually the band that I listened to, that I just went to their concert. The lead singer plays bagpipes. And, uh, and there's a sound there. Are you guys with me? Don't, don't lose me yet, okay? There's a sound there that draws people in. There's a reason why the bagpipes are played at funerals. There's a reason why the bagpipes uh, are like the national instrument uh, of a nation. In fact, it is the only instrument that was recognized as a weapon of war. It's the only, it's the only instrument that was ever recognized as a weapon of war. I'm pulling stuff out of 24 years ago teachings that I heard right now, and I didn't have this prepared ahead of time. Just stay with me.
to the point where in battle, uh, the Scots, if the piper was killed, they were commanded to the closest person next to them that knew how to play to drop their weapons and pick it up and continue on in battle playing the pipes because it led the sound of a charge. And it, and it inspired fear in the enemy and it inspired courage in the army. Still to this day, I believe it is the only instrument that is recognized as a weapon of warfare. Why am I saying this? Sound is important. Complaining is the worship music of hell. Complaining is the worship music of hell. If high praise is what's taking place in heaven, then it stands to reason that complaining is the worship music in hell. You know, I am, I've never been an overly spiritual person. I, I haven't. Uh, like, yes, there's times where I've tried to be. There's times where I've tried to uh, take on other people's mantles and other people's vision, other people's destinies. You know, like I, I hear things, I listen to teachings, I pick things up. And there are times when I have tried to take on other people's mantles because I love what they carry. But the reality is, at the end of the day, I'm actually not the most overly spiritual person. You can ask my wife. You can ask my parents. I'm not. So when I hear stories about warfare, when I hear stories about spiritual realms, when I hear stories about what's going on in a nation, in a time, in a season on the planet, my response is not like, I'm going to get some crazy prophetic word and, and gather prophets. or like My response is, I don't even know what to do. And I feel like there's so many believers that are the same way. I want to make an appeal to you as, as a normal person that isn't overly spiritual. But there is something that all of us have. There is something that God has given each and every one of us to shake not just hell, but to bring transformation into your life on a personal level and into the people that are around you, and that is worship. That is worship. There is a sound that I believe the Lord is asking each and every one of us. And here's the beautiful thing. It doesn't matter what you like or dislike in music. I, I, uh, Jeff did not know I was sharing on this this morning. And during worship, Jeff sent me a photo. Uh, Tandy, I hope you don't hurt me. But can I pop up a photo really quick? I love this. Jeff sent, uh, he didn't know I was speaking on worship this morning. He sent me two photos. Can I, can I share, share you something? It blew my mind. Or not. You see this? You see this down there? Do you know where this is? That's down there. Right? What is it? It's, it's the bluegrass band. Now, I, I don't want to overly spiritualize. I don't know if they're doing worship. My guess is they are, because Tandy's incredible. Yeah? No? Go to the next one. This one brought me a big smile on my face. Look at this stud. I mean, in, all, in the short time that I've been here, I had no idea that you carry a sound. Uh, you never brought it up, never mentioned it, but you carry a sound. And I'm sure that when you sing or when you play, you connect with God. See, in the beginning, God did what? He created. So often, we, we, we 
put ourselves in cycles, stand up, sit down, come to church, leave, and we forget that God is a creator. He's the most creative thing ever. And just to even say thing is, is the understatement of the century. He is, he is omnipotent. He is in everything, through everything, about everything. And, and he is a creator. He's put creativity in each and every one of you. And in that, he's designed you with a plan and a purpose. You have a sound. Now, don't ever ask me to sing. You don't want to hear my sound. I'm not asking Larry to sing anytime soon either, right? I've heard him up here. I've heard him try. It's, that's what you call it. Okay. So, in God's unique design and his plan, he created you with a purpose and he created you with a gift mix. He created you with the ability to create. You are made in his image. Worship has nothing to do with how you feel or how gifted you are. It has everything to do with the heart. It has everything to do with faith, and it has everything to do with, I want to use the word humility, but I'd rather use meekness. It's a horse apiece. But I think humility gets a bad rap in the church because the church affiliates humility with timidity. And that is the opposite of biblical humility. I find most people don't tap in to a gift that was given by God, the creator of the universe, before the beginning of time because they're full of pride. They don't think they have something. They don't think they carry something. But I want to tell you something. The warfare you're experiencing, I would go to say that most of it isn't warfare. It's laziness. <laughs> it's laziness. Okay, that didn't go over well. Don't blame the enemy when you haven't picked up your weapon of warfare. Don't blame the enemy when you're waiting for a leader to go to battle for you. What I, Larry's preached this a million times. I've, I've, I've preached it a half a million after I stole it from him. It's this, and David ran at Goliath. He runs at the enemy that was defying the armies of the living God. We cannot just sit there as the most trained army expecting a leader to fix what's going on. In our families, in our community, in our church. No, God has given you a weapon, and I don't care whether it's bluegrass I don't care whether it's Mozart. I don't care whether it's what I'm into, which most of you would call me demonic for. I love it. <laughs> I actually struggled through this for years. And I did. I struggled through my taste in music. And I love a lot of different things. But I like the stuff where, you know, you know, let's go for it. Come on. Come on, can I get an amen from me? I'm up here all by myself. I'm poor. Come on, brother. Yes. Shaved, shaved uh, head on the sides. Yep, let's go. Right? Like, I want to fight someone when I worship. Do you know what I'm saying? Come on, don't judge me. I want to, like, I want to freaking... Come on, Jeff Myers, you're leaving me up here, like... I know, I know you, Jeff. Like, when I worship, I don't want to, like... I don't want to... Come on. Come on. Come on. No, I want to I give him everything I got, everything I got. And I want to make sure that every demon in hell knows I'm coming for them. And I'm sorry, that doesn't look like, oh, you're so sweet, little Jesus. You know, like, no. 
I'm gonna bite someone's ear off. <laughs> this is me. And you know what? My wife, the total opposite. When we come together and worship, it is, warfare is created, okay? <laughs> it's literally created. You have a gift. You have something inside of you. And I do believe meekness is a part of it. Because, see, the, the reason why I don't want to use humility, or meek, uh, I'd rather use meekness, is meekness... Meekness is actually a term of strength, okay? Meekness, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just, let's talk about meekness for a second. It comes from the Greek word prowess, right? When the Apostle Paul lists meekness as the eighth attribute among the fruit of the Spirit, he uses the Greek noun pratios or prautias. And meekness is the closest translation to the Greek word used here. We are to be meek, which means this, yielded, teachable, responsive. Here's some Greek uh, words. Here are some definitions for meekness. Are you ready? It's used in describing a soothing medicine. It's used by sailors to describe a gentle breeze. It's used by farmers to describe a broken colt. Why? Why? Because all of them have the ability to do destruction. All of them. Medicine, wind, a stallion, that's, it has the ability to go very powerful, yet it is holding back. It's holding back. It's control. Can I give you another definition? Let me just pull from some notes I had. Um, gentleness refers to actions. Meekness refers to attitude. Stay with me. Here's the best definition I found. It's this. Those who have weapons and the ability to use them but they determine to keep their weapon sheathed. And that means this, people who are capable of force, but decide not to use it, they take the proper position. That is a position of meekness. Okay, so Will, it sounds like you're telling me to worship, but it also sounds like you're telling me not to worship. Listen, that's not what I'm saying. Most people are sitting on a gold mine, on a weapon. And in fear, you don't pull it out. Or in pride, you don't pull it out. But you have something that is inside of you. And there are times when other people aren't that you need to go to war. You, you need to go to war. And you need to let it rip. And not hold back. And each and every one of you has a sound given to you by God. And I believe it's time. I believe it's time not to wait for the next revival. I believe it's time not to wait for the next message where you get another key and a potion and a strategy and a prophetic word. I actually believe that there is transformation that comes in our lives when we stand up and run. Congo. Some of the craziest worship I've ever witnessed. Musi knows this. We, we would go into the middle of nowhere. This is an actual war zone, okay? Going into a war zone, people that know nothing but abuse, hurt, pain, disappointment, children are taken, right? The craziest worship I have ever heard in my entire life, and they had no electricity and no instruments. It would go on for hours. They would take these cans that they would get oil from, like uh, cooking oil from different aid organizations, and they would shape them into about the size of my Bible, like a, like a box, and they would hours and hours. And you knew it was good when the cans started flying around, around the room. Next thing you know, you're dodging these things. 
razor blades. <laughs> Worship has nothing to do with electricity. It has nothing to do with keys. It has nothing to do with notes. It has everything to do with the passion that's on your heart. And are you holding back from God? Are you holding back? We cannot hold back in this season. And I'm not talking about corporate worship just in a church. It, as, as you are going about your day, Paul says this, I pray ceasingly. I, I think about that all the time. Are you talking about tongues? Because it sounds like a lot to be sitting there going, oh, Lord, uh, I love you. Or, oh, Lord, help my family. You know, like that's, that's, you can only do that for a limited amount of time. After that, you got two options, tongues and you got worship. You can pray for everybody, the church, your family, name, give them by name, spend time on each, in each and every one of them, and only, only begin to step into a small amount of the day. I believe what he's speaking to is praying in the Spirit and in worship. Is your heart alive with praise? Well, Will, I don't feel it. It doesn't feel like a time. I've lost someone. We're facing challenges. We're losing anything. I'm going to tell you, there isn't anything better. In fact, I don't even believe there isn't a holier call than giving him praise in the midst of chaos. You only have a few moments in your life when you can praise him in the moment of loss. And that praise costs you something. Yet, it is the one thing that people do is they, they, they exit it and they look for answers. But there are only answers from God that you can find in a place of worship and high praise. There's only, it is only in that place that you get to meet him. The, the, the biggest, uh, one of the biggest issues I see in people ooh, in the church, and I love the church. And, and let me rephrase it. It's not the biggest issue. God, I, I need to pace. It's one of, the, one of the biggest challenges, the repeated challenges I hear from people, and it and it's real, and it's raw, and it's natural, is I've experienced loss. Where's God? I'm going through chaos. Where's God? And it's the one thing that I see people throw God out the window, let go of everything that they've been taught, or I see them go into worship. When Moosey got diagnosed with cancer, uh, gosh, it's going on two years. It'll be two years in just like a, a little bit. I'll never forget it. We went through it the first time, failed miserably. I would say, I mean, we did it. You're alive, thank you, like 10 years ago, praise the Lord. But like, we made so many mistakes during that time. There's two things, though, that, that, that we implemented. Actually, one that I want to really talk about. I didn't know what to do. It was chaos. Our whole life was falling apart. Everybody was telling us, you know, she has cancer because of A, B, C, D, E, F, G. You know, everything's up in the air. Am I going to be a single dad? Is she, uh, you know, going to lose her, her life? Like, everything is up in the air. And all of a sudden, like, I didn't, we didn't have money. We didn't have much of anything. And now I know, like, I'm going to have to pull off the road it was chaos. Everything was chaos. You look to the left, chaos. You look to the right, chaos. And many of you in this church know exactly what I'm talking about. You've been there. Amen? Come on, don't just stare at me. Right? I had this thing inside of me that was like, we have to put worship in the house 24-7. And man, much to my wife's chagrin, I went out and spent like two grand on Sonos speakers. And I put them in every single room. We didn't have the money. We, we shouldn't have done it. But I put, do you know what Sonos, they're like wireless, you know? And I freaking glued an iPad to the wall. And I put a bunch of Julie True on there. And I'm not even, like, I, if you ask me, Will, if you want to worship, you know, what are you going to listen to? Like, I love her as a human, but, like, it's not my go-to. I put Julie True on there, and we played it 24-7 in the house. For eight months, that stuff played 24-7 in the house. To the fact, like, I know every song. Because I knew, I knew that if that wasn't the backdrop of what we were doing, then, then we're bound to fail. So often people throw out the most simplest of things in the, in the minutes, in the moments of chaos. The second time, it was, it was October two, two years ago, 
We found out, and it was all of a sudden. Moosey calls me, she's weeping. Where are you? Like, click. She, I didn't even know she was at the doctor's office. I had to track her on the phone. I show up. I'm running through levels of this place. Where's my wife? I, I find her. She's weeping. I'm like, what's going on? She says, it's back. I'm like, nah. And I just bust in through the door. Where's the doc? He was meeting with other people. And I'm like, I'm sorry. You need to leave whatever meeting and come and talk to us now. And he was like, okay. And so he talks to us, and he's like, I got bad news for you. And, and, and we, we hit our, our car just, and it was in the moment, like legitimately, it was at one of the greatest moments that we had had as a ministry, Iris. We, we had just culminated our first all-Iris family gathering. Missionaries came from all over the world. And then, for the first time, I gathered 150 of our leaders, just our base leaders in one place. And we were so in envision. So it was like, and I was getting ready to speak. It was the last session of three weeks of two years of, of putting this thing together. Phone rings. And I remember leaving the doctor's office and we're driving up the driveway to our office. And, and I'm like, I'm just going to go home. I'm going to pick up my car and... And I just remember pulling off down a side road. And we pulled into the woods. And we got out of our truck. We climbed up in the bed of my truck. And we sat on my toolbox. And we just worshipped. And I don't have a voice. Why? Because I knew that we screwed it up maybe the first time, yeah, we put the worship on. But I knew that I had this one moment of chaos. And we're in it. We're in it. It's not like a week later. It's not after we've told the kids. It's the first fruits of chaos. What can we give him? Even though everything in the natural is saying he's turned his back on you. He's not the God who you say he is. He's not the God who you preach about. He's not the God that heals your wife. She's going to die. This is what's going on in the back of my mind. And in that moment, we kicked it out of the freaking park where we failed eight years earlier. Who gives a rip? I'm sorry. Who gives a rip if you didn't do it well one season? No, you had today. Who cares? You have today. And we sat there and we worshiped. I don't know, it must have been an hour, just the two of us. We didn't talk, we didn't strategize, we just worshiped. And he didn't fix it all, except he put our hearts in a direction of unity. So much disunity is in houses. I'm going to be really vulnerable. Moosey and I, we have a hard time praying together. Right? As soon as we got married. What, give us some advice. Pray together. Read the word together every day. I'm like, ugh. <laughs> Still to this day, it's been 20 years. I hate, I shouldn't say that. I <laughs> don't enjoy Sitting there, we pray totally different. We pray totally different. I'm like, the word of God says this. She's like, oh, Lord, I love you and soft kittens. And I'm like, no, let's freaking war, girlfriend. Like, let's, like, no, the Bible says, like, I will analyze her prayers as she's praying them. Don't judge me. Don't look at me. Oh, y'all are looking at me like, oh, how dare. No, y'all do the exact same thing. I'm just, I'm just humble enough to admit it. Come on, meek enough. You got that, brother. Stay with me. And we might screw up in the prayer time that we have together because that's based on us. Worship cannot be based on you. It has to be offered up unto him because he is the lamb who was slain. Worthy, we sang it today, worthy is the Lamb 
who's seated on the throne. There is a difference in worship and praise. And I would say this, there's a difference in worship and high praise. When you can offer him high praise, high praise, not just singing songs about him, but songs to him, about who he is, not just about what he's done, but to him, about who he is, I am telling you, there isn't a freaking demon in hell that can tolerate that. God knows when you're faking it. I, uh, I, I love, every year I, I start off with a fast, and I, it's just been a thing that I've been doing uh, these last eight or nine years. And usually like day 30, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm up sitting watching YouTube cooking shows. This is a thing. I've heard other people talk about it. I'm telling you, this is real. I plan food that I'm going to eat at the end. And for some reason, I got on this kick of mole. Does any, any Latinos in here? Hola, que tal? Uh, um, right? I don't know what it was, but I turned on this thing one day, and I'm, and I'm, and I'm watching somebody make mole. Oh, do you know about mole? Oh, my God. It's like frankincense and myrrh and ambrosia and all things wonderful it's the fatted calf it's everything it is the pearl of great price and like an authentic one is like 48 spices and things mixed together it's it is complex beyond anything but it looks like uh you know missionary uh sickness you know <laughs> it does but man so i'm sitting there and i'm watching this and I'm like, man, this is going to be, I'm breaking my fast with mole. So I start gathering herbs and spices. I start doing recipes, right? I start planning this thing out. And then I come and I'm breaking my fast. Moosey remembers this. It was like, what's that? You don't remember this. And that's what our worship time looks like. Uh, so... <laughs> I, I, I'm there and I go to this Mexican market and, and I find the biggest oldest lady I can find whatever don't judge me it is accurate and you would do the exact same thing I'm like hola You want to give me your mole recipe? <laughs> and I had her, I was like, I married a Latina. She's like, okay. And so she comes and she starts telling me how to make mole. And she starts going through. And I'm like, I, I'm grabbing stuff. Next thing I know, I have like $150 and she's, of stuff. And she's like, or you can just get this jar. This stuff's pretty good. And I was like, I think it was like day, day 39. I was like, I'll just buy the jar. So I get the jar, I go home, and I dump it on chicken. And it tasted awful. I call up a friend. I call up a friend who's, you know, got some mole in his blood, you know? Taste it. He's like, this is garbage. There's an authentic sound that can only be created through heart. It cannot be created through a factory. I could care less if it looks like it, smells like it, even tastes like it. At the end of the day, there's no heart in it. I promise you. So I went to Mexico, and I shared this story. Next thing I know, I had like four grandmothers making me mole. I ate mole for days, every day. And I'm telling you, it's, 
incredible. It tastes nothing like that stupid jar. It was like everything I was dreaming during my fast. And each one totally different. And they all came up to me after this conference. They were like, oh, I'm going to make you some. I use this. Oh, I'm going to make some. I use this. And I sat there and gained about five pounds. You cannot replace heart with factory made. Anyone can tell the difference unless you have only fed yourself off jars. Unfortunately, unfortunately, there is a culture, I believe, that has been created in these last few years of professionalism. I don't want professionalism, I want heart. I don't care how it sounds. I don't care if the notes are on or off. I want real. And here's the thing about real, like what I said about revival. It doesn't get more real than that. Let me get into the word, and then I'm going to be done. You want to know what triggered this little message as I was driving over here? It was, it was Larry showed me a video a couple nights ago. The, where's the gentleman that's up here? Rich. Rich. Hey, Rich. I need your assistance. Don't worry. I didn't tell anybody what I'm about to do. Rich, I need your assistance, my friend. Larry sh shared with me a little video, and I thought it was just the most beautiful thing I'd seen in a long time. Where's my keys guy? Jeff. Jeff. Actually, why doesn't the whole worship team come on up here? They didn't know I was going to do this. I'm putting you on the spot. You're welcome. I was, I, I, was, uh, I was interviewing a friend of mine who has a Christian band that is nothing like what y'all listen to, okay? Very, very heavy, very, very powerful, very, very loud, but it is worship, okay? It's just different. Most of y'all wouldn't worship to it, and I asked him. I said, Tommy, that's his name. His name's Tommy Green. He's from the Dr Green. He's from the band Sleeping Giant. And he, he said, I said, what would you tell, if you were to show up at a church like this, what would you tell them about your music? Somebody that doesn't understand what you do, why you do, and how you do it. And he went on and on. He said, we go to people that are hopeless, and we, and we sing in their language. There's always something about a community and a tribe, especially in missions. What we've learned is don't bring in outside worship. Pull on the hearts and people that are there. Tandy, I love that. I love that bluegrass. Pull on the hearts and people that are there. And he says, there is a sound in the tribe that we serve, which is the lost, the broken, the dying, the suicidal, those who feel downtrodden, those who feel like they're not seen. And he goes, we sing in their song. He says... But Will, on top of that, what we do is biblical. I said, please tell me. And he began to talk about the different types of worship that are found in the Bible. I'd like to go through them with you, if that's okay. There's seven types of worship. Barak, it means this, to bow down, to kneel before the Lord. That's Barak, not Obama. That's Barak, to bow down and to kneel in front of the Lord. I, stay, are you guys alive? Yeah. Okay, stay with me. I'm almost done. Don't worry. To bow down or kneel in front of the Lord. When was the last time you bowed down in worship? Therefore, there is now no condemnation. This isn't a thing about condemnation. This is a thing about I want to encourage you because of what we're facing right now. To bow down or kneel in worship. Here's the next one. Halal, I love this, to shine, boast, rave about, celebrate, or even be clamorously foolish. Come on. See, a lot of the charismatic movement got into this one. 
right? Like, when was the last time you were foolish in front of God? Clamorously foolish. Clamorously foolish. Clamorously foolish. When was the last time you got in front of the Lord and got clamorously foolish? And the Holy Spirit touched me at 17. I came home, and we had storm windows on our house. You don't have them here. We have them in New England. And it's an older house, so you actually had to physically take on and off these outer w windows for winter. I got saved on a Thursday, Friday. I woke up, went to school, came back home, and it was my job that week to put the storm windows on. Nobody was home in my house. And I get up there, and I'm still shaking from this encounter I had with the Holy Spirit from the night before. I get home. I go up onto the roof, and I climb up to the top, the tippy top of the roof, and the Holy Spirit hits me. I was saved all of 20 hours, and the Holy Spirit hits me on top of the roof, and the only thing inside of me was this, I have to worship. I have to worship. I have to worship. And so I ran down, back downstairs, and I found, uh, we had a, like a CD player, and I turned up all of the volume, and the only worship song album I could find was Lady Smith Mombaza, like Rejoice Africa. I throw it on, I crank it up, I run back up on the roof, and I stand up there on the roof of our house, and I start pirouetting like a ballerina. And as I'm doing it, I'm going, I look so stupid. I look so stupid. But I could care less. And I'm willing to be clamorous, clamorously foolish. When was the last time you were foolish in front of the Lord in worship and abandonment? When was the last time? See, we get around a culture of people and we don't want to make anybody uncomfortable. We don't want to make people feel awkward. We don't want to make people feel different. We don't want to feel uncomfortable, right? It's pride. Now, and then what ends up happening is the crazy person in the church, right, who's just always like that, right, they end up taking it. And you're like, I don't want to be like that person. So I'm just going to, you know, dumb it down. Gosh, I got the joy, 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 joy. Come on, come on. I got the joy, 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 joy. Where is it? Deep down where nobody can see it. What a demonic song. Think about it. Where's your joy, Larry? It's down. So deep. I hide it away only for special occasions like birthdays and Christmas. What the heck are we even talking about? This is... The church. I got it down so far that nobody knows it's there. Come on. Come on. Can you play for me for a minute just while I'm, while I'm doing this? Thank you. It'll help me end fast. Shabbat. To shout loudly or command. Tommy's like, that's what we do. We shout loud and we command. We go to war. He goes, church doesn't like that. It makes them uncomfortable. They don't like shouting. They don't like commands. Do you know that in each one of these, and I just don't have time to give every Bible reference, there are specific times that you need to engage in a specific way to see a specific move take place in your life and in those around you. Here we go. Tehillah, to sing unrehearsed, unplanned praises. Come on. Come on, you're just, you're just going down the road, listening, listening to your uh, bluegrass, 
You're like, Jesus, I love you, I love you. You know, like you just crush it. That is, there's power in that. Unrehearsed and unplanned. Your joy's showing. Come on. Don't keep it down. To da, to extend or raise your hands in thanksgiving for something that hasn't yet occurred or that you haven't yet received. It is calling those things that are not as though they are. Father, I know you're good in the midst of the chaos. Lord, I know that you're healing my wife and I will worship you in the midst of it all. I will give you praise. You are worthy. You are worthy. You are holy. You are the God that heals. There is a place in worship where you get to lift your hands and pray and call what is not as though it is. Come on. I love it. Thank you, Lord. Two more. Yada. To extend your hands vigorously as in complete surrender. A lot of, a lot of the church is comfortable with this one. In fact, these are the last two that most of the church is comfortable with. And I would say that they only dwell in one, which is this, Zamar. To touch the strings, mostly rejoicing. Come on. I want you to bless us. I want you to touch those strings, man. Go for it, man. that you don't give them 75% that you take a moment and step out of your comfort zone I don't mind I don't care if it's 
you, you kneel on the side or you just do something different. Taste and see that he's good. Just try something different for a moment. Just try something different for a moment. I promise you, whether you are bowing down, whether you're shining or boasting, or clamorously foolish. Some of y'all need to get clamorously foolish. You forgot what it, what it is to be foolish in front of the Lord. You forgot what it is to be foolish in front of the Lord. Come on. Whether, whether you get a Shabbat, right? To shout loudly or command. Come on. Father, touch my family, God. Father, touch this church, God. Some of y'all need to extend to die. Raise your hands in thanksgiving. Thanksgiving for something that hasn't yet occurred that you haven't yet received. Father, we're asking God for our kids to walk with you and talk with you, Lord. And we give you praise, God. We give you praise. Thank you, Lord. Some of y'all need to surrender. You've been in control for too long. altar is open right now the altar is open and I believe that some of you got to get out of your seat and come to the altar come on just come to the altar and I believe the Holy Spirit is gonna fill you up overflowing unlike ever before Yada, to extend your hands as in complete surrender and then Zamar, to touch the strings rejoicing. Come on, brother. Come on. I know you've got more in you. I, I want you to take us somewhere. Give us some rejoicing. Give us some rejoicing right now. He is healer. He is healer. Heidi was dying. She was dying. I was there. She was dying. She was in the hospital. And we almost lost her. She had this crazy disease and she checked herself out. And she flew to our church in Pemba. And she preached on a Sunday morning half dead. And she prayed for my wife and I and the team that was going to Congo. I was sharing the story earlier. And she finished preaching because she felt like the Lord told her that if she went to church that she would get healed. And she didn't. She ended up catching a flight right back in right back into South Africa in the hospital, dying for the next two days. I think a week went by, and she had this conference that she had to go to in Toronto. And so she against every doctor she was dying she got on a plane and flew to Toronto landed at the church and the Lord said get up and I want you to dance on stage and as she danced she got completely healed surrender and adoration unto him so often we just hold back out of pride the Bible says unless you become like a child you cannot enter the kingdom that's a scary verse my friends professionalism in my life. I want raw, random abandonment. He does 
doesn't mean that we don't have excellence. It doesn't mean that we live in chaos. No, no, no. When the Bible says, give him everything, that's not chaos. And for each person, it looks differently. But I'm telling you this, it can't look the same as it has looked. It has to look different than what it's been. The saltiness can't lose its, its salt. Salt can't lose its saltiness. And sometimes it's not your marriage. It's not the spiritual climate. It's not the politics in the day. It's the church has forgot how to give it's the first love. They shall go out with joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills shall break forth before you enter his courts with thanksgiving. and praise. ordered them to be stripped and beaten. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. Upon receiving such orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in stalks. Beaten, silenced, chained verse 22 no I'm sorry verse 25 about midnight Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God and the other prisoners were listening suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open and everybody's chains came loose. Do you know that you can worship in the midst of your chaos and it sets others free? <laughs> See, worship isn't just about you. It actually sets others free. Anybody can worship when it's good, but can you worship after being beaten and flogged and put in chains? That, that costs you something. testimony is that if you can do that then others around you who didn't pay the price that you had to pay they get freedom I don't know about you but that's the kind of worshiper that I want to be so father I thank you that you're shaking chains off today God those who have been beaten and, and flogged and bound. And Lord, I thank you, Lord, that you are the God that breaks chains, that breaks yokes, that lifts burdens of oppression, depression, suicide, beatings. You are the God that in the midst of injustice pours out your justice. 
You are the God that brings freedom. And you are not a God that's silent. You come with earthquakes on the praises of your name. You come and you shake the foundations of what is used to incarcerate people. You shake the foundations of what is bound precious believers. You shake the foundations as we praise you. It is warfare. Just unadulterated praise to him is warfare. So Father, I give you praise. I give you praise. We give you praise. Precious Holy Spirit, you're doing even here in this room I thank you for your presence and Lord you said where the spirit of the Lord is there's freedom there's freedom thank you father said it, David, uh, we're going to end with this, and we're going to pick this back up. I mean, pick it back up. <laughs> but, uh, take it up a notch. But um, I was just thinking, and just ending here, I was thinking that it was uh, David, you know, David was not just a, <clears throat> a great man of war, he was an a amazing musician, Amazing harpist. He was a songwriter. He's a poet. He's something. What a what a musician David was. He led the priests and dancing before the Lord foolishly. The scripture says the king says foolishly. And if you remember his wife, which was one of Saul's daughters, made fun of him and was embarrassed about him. She was stricken barren because of it. Remember that story? Or did I just make that up? That's in the Bible. She was stricken barren. And some of the bar- and I'll just say in, in end with this. Some of the barrenness we have in the church is Saul's wife's barrenness, not willing to tolerate the foolishness of worship that David's do. She was she was embarrassed. Her husband was dancing foolishly before the Lord, but he was dancing because the presence was coming back to Israel and the ark was coming back. So I just thought of that and I thought that's that's where we're at as a uh, as a. Uh, church in a world and since you got real vulnerable i do a flu for like 30 seconds i can do that now that most people are gone so you know what i was doing at two o'clock last night it's just a hard time with a lot of us i'm a musician musician since i was a kid music is my life everything's a lyric to me everything's a song i was up at two o'clock with the creator listen to the eagles all of the eagles is hits Especially, I can't tell you why. Such precision, such beauty, such harmony. And I was listening and I was crying. I cried for a long time, had my head down on the desk. And I thought, where is that sound? You gave it to them and they misused it. God, you give us that sound and that, that musicianship. That I mean, if you ever just listen to that song, I can't tell you why. The harmony, the precision, the it's like, wow, it moved my heart, my soul. I couldn't, I cried for an hour. Like, wow. And, 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 and at any rate, so I didn't know this was going to happen. He didn't know that was going to happen. But you don't have to be a musician for that to happen to me. But I tell you what, when you hear a sound and you're God's, you're a sounding board, you know the sound. And it's unfortunate the world has done better than that, or better than that, especially back in that era. Um, we were still back there jumping up and down singing Jesus on the main line while the Eagles were doing this amazing music and of course the Australian group as well and um, and so um, I believe God wants to turn us or return us back to the heart of worship and um, in a way that's uh, authentic and that, that again it strikes the heart you know because I went through on the computer through the Christian worship nothing touched me Till I got to the Eagles. <laughs> and, 
And I know that may sound crazy to religious people, but that's a musician in me that said everything about it was just like original, authentic, and wonderful, and from the heart, a written, written uh, from, from the heart. And so I believe that's why God wants to return to us. So Father, Lord, we ask you that you would help return to the body of Christ, the church of Jesus Christ, the authentic sound that we hear an echo in those who are not yours, who have been willing to go where even the church is not willing to go in the sing and write from their heart and to be authentic. Lord, that you would give to us and we take back those things that belong to the body of Christ. And that's the sound of heaven, the sound of worship and the sound of praise and the sound of perfection. I don't mean perfection as in perfect musicianship, but perfection as in heart. For in a perfect heart, you find refuge, Lord. So the perfect heart of worship is not a perfect pitch. It's just a perfect feeling. So, Lord, we thank you for the feeling of that. And we thank you, Lord, that let this not be the end, but the beginning as a nation, as a church, to return to the heart of worship, as David did. God, give us the heart of David. The heart of David. Give us the heart of David and not the curse of his wife, Saul's daughter. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Amen.